my name is Nancy Solomon. I'm the director of Long Island Traditions. Today is February 5th, 2018, and I'm talking with Billy Painter. Um, can you please introduce yourself? And Sure. My name is William Painter. I live in Babel, New York. I've been a bayman for over 33 years. I work out of the Oyster Bay Harbor, and uh, I am right now currently the president of North Oyster Bay Bayman's Association. Okay. What was your first memories of going out onto the bay? How, how old were you, and what were you doing? <laughs> well, going onto the bay, I started off fishing. Um, I was My father was a big fisherman. And see, coming out of Seacliff, and we used to fish Hempstead Harbor all the time, and I always enjoyed the water. I I, I, I grew up in Seacliff. Um, I moved to Babel a few years after I, uh, I was into high school, and um, you know the water was always an important thing to me. Being able to walk out of my house and ride my bicycle down to the beach, and and that's how it's always been. So um, finally, I decided to get into clamming and try it. I talked to a good friend of mine that was plumbing at, the, at that time. So let's, let's give it a try. We put a boat together and uh, took a couple of months to get everything figured out of what equipment we would need, um, what type of boat would be the right boat to, to harvest clams from. And uh, we finally put the boat together. We went out on a Saturday. Uh, he was working another job, I was working another job. So we went out on our first day out clamming, and uh, it was funny. Um, we were so excited. Our, our first pull on the rake, we came up with seven clams in the basket, and uh, we actually high-fived each other. We thought it was great. We were like, this is fantastic. We were expecting to catch nothing. And um, from that day on, it only took another week of playing around with it, and uh, I quit my job. Bob was the other guy. Bob quit his job in plumbing, and we started full-time clamming. Okay. Um, what about growing up? Had you ever done anything like that? Um, basically all the, yeah, when I was a young, young boy, um, my, whole, my whole thing with clamming was just recreation. Uh, parents would take me down to the beach. My father used to tell me stories about during the Depression, um, they had no money. Everybody in Seacliff, if there was a lot of baymen, a lot of people clammed for an occupation. They would harvest clams. Some would be sold for money. They actually even used the clams to, to swap for tomatoes or whatever other type of food. So uh, my, 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 my grandfather was a clammer, and my great-grandfather was also a clammer at an Oyster Bay. So I kind of always had this thought of fishing and clamming was probably going to end up in my, in my future, which it did. Okay. Um, so where do you go clamming? Right now, most of the clamming that, that the guys from the North Oyster Bay Bayman Association go is we work areas in Oyster Bay Harbor, also Cold Spring Harbor, it's an adjacent harbor, it's joined together. Um, a lot of, a lot of a lot of baymen will travel out into the Long Island Sound and work areas anywhere from the Sound of Hempstead Harbor all the way to Lloyd Harbor. So we have a pretty big area that we could choose from and the choice comes from based on conditions, based on what the wind is blowing, how the tide is running. Um, you, you always want to try to get your conditions together. You want to try to work along with the wind and the current. If you have wind blowing out of the south and the tide's coming in from the north behind you, it doesn't really give you great digging conditions. The boat fights itself with the two different uh, wind and tides. So once you figure out what that day is going to bring you for wind direction and your, your tide chart, then usually the night before you look at the weather and you say, all right, now tomorrow it's going to be blowing out of the north, but the uh, tide's going to be rolling out. This area in the harbor is going to work for me. It's going to give me my best, my best conditions. And that's how all the Bayman base their day on. Um, before we had things like the Weather Channel and, you know, all the, and the Internet, 
how would you you know decide where you were going to go? What what methods did you use to tell you what were going to be the good conditions? Well, that was a little tougher back then. Um, that was more or less a hit and miss. You would you would get on your boat that day before you before you rolled out into the harbor. You knew you knew the wind direction. You knew hey, it's blowing this way, so I'm going to work this portion of the harbor. Um, but things change, you know. As the day goes on, your, your currents change, your winds change. In the summertime, you always get those afternoon southern breezes that come up. So you, you learn by that. You, you know that you, you expect in the afternoon there's a good possibility of a south southwest coming up. Um, so you'll base your, your, your work areas on your, on your weather conditions. But... Uh, during dur during this period of time, with the with proper forecasts, it's much easier now. All you have to do is put the Weather Channel on, on News 12, and you pretty much know what it's going to be. Um, what kinds of tools do you use to go clamming? Um, the the uh, general tools that we use on our boat right now is um, a, a rake. We have a uh, we use clam rakes that are either a steel rake or a lot of guys prefer getting stainless steel rakes. Um, they range in anywhere in size from a 14 inches wide with an opening um, to some guys like to pull big gigantic rakes 26 inches wide. The bigger the rake, the harder to pull. Um, also guys um, need equipment like pipe tubing. It's aluminum tubing, they come in 12 foot sections and it's like um, to give you an example. It's uh, if you're working in if you're working in 20 feet of water, you need five pieces of pipe together, five 12 footers together. Um, they all telescope together. One piece of tube fits into the other, so you could you could slide it, um, your pipe together and make a different lengths, and they're hose clamped together. Um, those are your two most important pieces of equipment in order to harvest a clam. And then on your boat, you have, you have a, a culling rack. Your culling rack is where you dump your clams on this rack. And um, it has a, a, a gauge where it'll have the smaller clams drop through if they're at seed size, non-sellable. And you'll be able to cull the rest of your clams that lay on top of that rack and sort them by different sizes. You know, you have your little neck, which is your small clam. That's your most desirable half shell clam to eat. And your next size up is a top neck, and then you have a cherry, and then you have your chowder, which is your biggest biggest clam. So that's that's some of your equipment on the boat. Okay. Um, I know that, you know, there are some new regulations um, that affect, you know, what to do with the clams once they're on your boat. Can you describe those for people that might not be familiar? You know? Sure. Once once you once you pull your rake into the boat and you dump your catch onto your onto your cull rack, it's important this the New York State DEC wants you to cull out your clams immediately. They don't want them to be sitting out in the sunlight. They don't want them to be they want to they want you to harvest them, dump them, count them, sort them and bag them and put them into a uh, a, like a cooler with ice in them to keep them fresh. So um, that's basically, you know, during, during the winter time, there's, there's less bacteria in the water. Um, so, you know, you could, you don't really need to store them in a cooler. You could store them on top of a blanket and closed in, but they have new laws now during the summertime. It goes from May to the end of October um, the state imposed these new, new laws saying, all right, every time you dump your clams on the cull rack, we want you immediately to count, sort them out, bag them, and then take those bags and put them in a iced cooler where that product will stay chilled down. It'll start cooling itself down to a certain temperature. They prefer 50 degrees and below, anywhere between... 38 and 50 degrees storing and uh, this way you don't you don't cause any chance of any type of bacteria levels in that clam to intensify by the heat of the sun or you know just room to the, the outdoor temperature so uh, we had back a few years ago um, we had a couple of incidents on Long Island and 
a few right in Oyster Bay Harbor that um, this Vibrio, it's a form of bacteria, natural occurring bacteria, um, had gotten some people sick that ate clams at a restaurant and um, they figured the best way to stop that problem from happening was proper handling of your shellfish. And so far in the last couple of years with this program going on, it's been working. We don't see as many incidents and I just think it's, it's a safe practice that we've always should have used. It's getting better. Okay. Um, can you talk about, you know, the difference between how you harvest clams and say, you know, one of the companies in Oyster Bay harvests clams? Sure. Them. So the baymen are still harvesting clams pretty primitive. I mean, all in all, the, the, uh, it's the same same way they've they've been clamming for the last hundred years. The only thing is is our equipment has has gotten a little better. We've learned how to design the rake a little bit better, um, make a little tweaks to it, sometimes different teeth, but in general we're still doing it the old traditional way. Um, yeah, you know, a clammer's rake does disturb the bottom a little bit, um, but. To, to only the degree that we basically are just scratching the bottom um, and causing the most minimal harm to the environment. Whereas we have, um, we've, been, we've been really uh, been opposed to what other methods that a company local in a harbor is using. Um, the company is using hydraulic shellfish dredging. They use these great big boats, they're 40 foot offshore Novi boats, um, big diesel powered, and they run these hydraulic dredges. And the hydraulic dredge, to, to try to give you a description of what it is, it's about an 800 to 1,000 pound dredge. It's like a huge rake. It has a uh, cutting knife on it, so when the dredge is lowered to the, to the bottom of the seabed, um, it's, it's pulled by a tow rope by this big offshore boat. And um, it, it, the boat on, on the boat, what it does is it has a, um, it has a, I'm trying to think of the words here. It has a, um, a generator, a diesel motor on that sucks up water from the top of the, top of the harbor. And it, it gives high pressure water going down to the dredge to this manifold. And through the manifold, this water is pumped. The manifold acts as a um, it, it pumps water directly into the into the sediment, where it slurries the sediment. Can we start this over again? Because I'm just sure. If you could just back up on that. Well, because I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm not giving I'll, a good description, I'll, and I know I'll, I lost I'll, it two I'll, minutes ago. I'll take it, you out. Can take it out. Start over, okay. and let me just do one more thing. Okay. 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 It's okay. good? Okay. Yes. Okay. So you were... So I'll just start up with the dredging, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, As... basically, basically what the company in, in Oyster Bay, how, okay. how do they harvest clams? Okay, so so like other methods that, that a company in Oyster Bay is using, they're, they're using hydraulic shellfish dredging. Hydraulic dredges and suction type dredges. You know, we, 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 seem, we, we think that that type of activity is really causing massive amount of problems to the environment. Okay. I mean, you really don't need to, you know, dislodge 15, you know, inches of water jetting into the bottom to get a clam that's only a couple inches down. Okay. So. And what kind of boat do they use? And what kind of boats do you use? Yeah, most, most of the hand diggers um, are using boats anywhere from 18 feet to 24 foot boats, open deck boats, um, very either tiny small cabins or just center console boats. Um, where the company um, that's using dredges, they range from 40 feet to 100 foot vessels. So it's, it's a big difference. Absolutely. Yeah. So what's a typical day like for you? You know, what time do you start, you know, in the different seasons? Like, for instance, we're in winter right now. When, when, when can you go out and how long do you go out for? Right. In the winter, your, your time is 
your time element is only a certain amount of hours for the day. So a lot of guys try to get out as, as early as they can because a lot of days it's getting dark by 4.30, 5 o'clock, your day's knocked off. Um, so, you know, winter time, you got weather elements, you got ice, you got rain, you got snow. So a lot of the guys, um, you know, we have a lot of guys that are diehards. And no matter how bad the weather is, they're going out and, you know, they'll put, they'll put their six to eight hour day in. And, and believe me, six hours of clamming is, is a lot of work. Eight hours of clamming is for a young guy. Um, it's, it's physical from the moment you get on the boat to the, when you hit the dock to offload your clams and put all your harvest, all your clams and shellfish into your truck and then you still got to bring it to either some guys, a lot of guys sell wholesale or, you know, bring it to your restaurant for retail. Um, who do you personally, you know, sell to? Who, what are your customers like? <laughs> My customers are great. Um, I really chose a long time ago that I wanted to sell my product directly to restaurants. So um, I chose that route and, you know, it, it earns me more money because I can get a better price for my clam, but it also makes my day longer. Um, when I get in and I offload my clams and put all my put my boat away, make sure everything's ready for the next day. I still have to get in my truck and drive to these locations, whether it be, you know, the South Shore, it's every place is not close. So, you know, at that point, I'll run to the restaurant, sell my stuff. And then finally, my day's over when I get back home. Makes for a long day. Yeah. Has the price, how has the price been, you know, since when you began to now? Price, price for a long time, from when I first started clamming, um, was, stayed the same for a long time. Stayed pretty much the same for 20 years. It fluctuated by a few pennies, um, but never really went anywhere crazy. But in the last, in the last three years, our price is really skyrocketed um, we're probably doubled in a, in a wholesale price right now our price has doubled since three years ago and uh, it's probably the only reason why a lot of hand diggers are still out there because um, the 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 amount of catch the guys are doing on a daily average right now is very weak and if they weren't getting the great price I don't think they'd be able to afford to be in this business anymore. So the price, the price is saving us. Why has it become so much harder? Well, um, the fluctuation of, of harvest always changed. Um, you would have your good years and you'd have sets that come in and there would be abundance of clams. And then the baymen would work on those areas and deplete them down. And you'd always see, you know, you wait a few more years after that, you'd always see them rebounding, coming back. Um, and that, that's, been, that's been the general thing for many years. But in the, last, <clears throat> in the last 15 years, we're starting to see, you know, we're seeing a different routine. We're seeing that areas that once always became reproductive again and, and would reset up are no longer setting up. So um, we, we think that's basically contributed to the cause of hydraulic dredging in a harbor. Um, those areas are getting silted up. And because when they get silted up, the new juvenile babies, the larvae and the spat, they don't have anywhere to land on the bottom where they're going to be able to not get smothered. And, and you know, that's, that's our big issue right now is that what's causing Oyster Bay to not reproduce. And, you know, if you went down to the docks and watched, watched the clamors come in right now and offload their catch on their boat, you'd feel bad for them because there's, um, you know, the, the catch is continually dropping every year. It's scary. What do you like most about working on the bay? 
I would have to say everybody has the same answer to that. And I would think it's the freedom. I think that you get out there, you work for yourself. It's beautiful out there. You're, you're on a boat. Everybody loves to go fishing, right? So this is a type of fishing. Um, it's kind of like a uh, treasure hunt every day because, you know, you're going to look for that spot that's going to do you well. You know, it doesn't always happen. But um, just getting on the boat, being on the water, being with nature, um, birds, wild animals that you see running along the shoreline. I see during the day, I see little, little red foxes coming out, running along the, the beaches. Um, I have pet birds. I got seagull that comes to my boat. Same seagull comes to my boat year after year. I feed them all day. Bird will stand on my head. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> um, I just, I love the job. What are some of the things that people should know about your life, you know, working on the bay, that they don't? Um, I would have to say that, you know, for a long time, Bayman always kind of got a bad rap that they were, you know, that's, they work on the water because that's the only place they could work. But, you know, the truth behind the Bayman are is we have, we have Bayman that are New York, New York City fire, firefighters. We have baymen that are captains of local police force. We have baymen that are teachers. And it's, it's so funny because, to say, the one guy that's the captain on the police force, I know he does well. He makes good money. But for some reason, that guy, when he's off his other job, is always on the water. And it's just something that he loves to do. And I think that's what gets in our blood. It's, um, it's working in the environment, working with wildlife, and... What are the most important things that you need to know in order to work on the bay? Um, it's a good question. So, I think the important things that you should know are that if you're going to do this and you want it sustainable. You want to be able to go out and, you know, not, not destroy or hurt the environment. You're there because God, they're there because God put them there. And you should respect that. And, um, you know, I think that's getting, getting, that education part's getting a lot clearer to a lot of Bayman lately that, you know, this could all go away. This could all disappear with a click of the finger. Um, and unless you respect it and you give back, um, don't expect it to always be there if you don't monitor it. And, and, and that's one thing I could say is great about the um, Bayman's Association that we have. We have a lot of guys that will contribute their time and do things, do functions like cleanups, harbor cleanups, where they all put their boats in the water. We all go out and pick up all kinds of trash that's floating in the water or along the shorelines. We fill our boats up. Some guys do two, three, four trips, and we take all kinds of stuff out of the harbor, and it's thousands and thousands of pounds of, of trash removed in one day. And, um, you know, not only are we doing it that one day, but all year long, when that plastic bag comes floating by, you'll always see a bayman drive up to that bag and grab it and throw it in his boat, put it in the trash when he gets in. So it's, I think it's, you know, if, if we want to keep our waters pristine and keep it so our kids and their kids, and it'll be there for the future, we should just respect what we do and, 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 try every effort not to do any damage. Can you tell me a little bit of the background of the association and when it was founded and some of the things that you do? Sure. Um, we, we were established in 1986. We incorporated ourselves as a, a, a non-for-profit organization. And um, so we've been around for a while now. And uh, what we do is we do, we, we uh, 
we, we try to help whoever we can help. We do, we do charity work during throughout the year. We do functions at festivals where we have a shellfish booth where we sell shellfish on the half shell. Um, and those monies that are, those monies that are raised at these events, um, we put in an account and we just decide how to disperse them either by helping a seed program that we run, um, buying equipment, building equipment, um, buying clam seed, oyster seed, or every year we also, um, we, we donate to kids that are in need. Um, our, our biggest, our biggest festival is the Oyster Fest in Oyster Bay once a year. And we raise the most money at, at that, at that event. And, uh, when we're done with that event, we, we count all our money up and, uh, we, we then decide who we're going to donate to that year. And um, many years we would donate to um, charities like Wounded Warrior. Um, we really respect our military and, and guys that were hurt and can no longer, you know, do what they need to do. So we, we reach out. We always help those guys. Um, but we are also, um, we feel that kids are important. And, you know, we've always reached out to kids with cancer. Um, that's, that's been a big thing. Um, so... How do you teach younger people that want to become baymen? You know, what, what what are some of the things that you do for those seeking to follow in your footsteps? Um, yeah, late, lately um, the younger guys, I love seeing them coming on. Um, they they a lot of the young baymen start off as being deckhands on boats. Um, they're hired by by the digger, the clamor, to come on their boat and sort their clams they'll they'll sort them count them and bag them for the clamor and um i think that's when they get it in their blood that's when you know they they see the job as hey um you know i'm on a boat i'm out in the open this is great um and we take them in they you know after a few years of of working on the other guy's boat they really enjoy it and they decide this is what they want to do for their life Um, what do you see the future looking like for you and the other independent Batemen? Hmm. So our future right now is, is, is in the hands of, um, of all the people of this township to really take a deep look into what's going on. You know, my, my biggest, my biggest, um, concern is that, you know, we have a beautiful harbor. It's been known, it's named Oyster Bay Harbor. It's named after oysters. Um, we read the history of our settlers coming over. There was an abundance, abundance of shellfish in this harbor. That's why they, they moved here. And, um, you know, man has many times depleted it down. And we were very fortunate that it's always came back to a certain degree. But what I'm seeing now with no regulation going on, no one overseeing the activities that are happening in a harbor by these big company, um, it's catching up with the harbor. Um, like I said, areas that I've seen that would always be reproductive are no longer being reproductive. Um, and I always get answers, you know, I, I tell people about my issue with hydraulic dredging and right away the people come back and their answer is, well, you know, that company's been around for over a hundred years. And I'm like, oh, I don't really care how long that company's been around. Um, you know, he started off a hundred years ago with an oyster dredge and oyster dredges are still legal and allowed to use everywhere. I says he's, he's introduced new equipment, new boats, and can our harbor, you know, take the impact of this new stuff he's, he's, he's introducing? And it can't. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's scary. I mean, I've had, my, I've had my time on the water, and if it all ends in 10 years from now, um, I'm probably by then going to be retired. What's scary is it's not about me. And it's not about the other guys that have been baming for 30 years. 
this is an issue for the new guys. And are we still going to have clamming, shell fishermen, 30 years from now, 40 years from now? Or are we going to let this just all get ruined because someone needs to make a lot of money? And that's, that's the sad part. When were you born? When was I born? Mm -hmm. I was born in, in Seacliff in 1961. And is anybody in your family going to follow in your footsteps? That's, yeah. So, a long time ago, my, my son was just a little guy, 10 years old. I started taking him on the boat with me. And during the summer when he had off of school, he'd come out and count clams and hang out with me. And, you know, time went on. And when Will was 16, Will had his first boat. And uh, right now he's 30. So he's been clamming, and I always told him, you know, well, clamming's a great job for part-time. You know, I want you to do college, which he did, and, uh, you know, I want you to get a real job where you can get a pension and you can get, you know, benefits and you'll have a savings. And, you know, Will did all the school, and he went for all the tests to be a cop and, you know, he just, he's been working on the water long enough now that he's stuck out there. He mm. tells me, Dad, it's not about money. I don't care if I got a lot of money or I'll ever be rich. This is what I want to do. What, what am I going to tell the kid? Yeah. So he's happy. I did it. I'm happy. Why, why mm -hmm. should I talk him out of it, right? Sounds good. So. Mm. Well, I thank you. Very Thank much. You. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Mm, just, I'm good. Okay. Thanks, Nance. Thank you. That's the end of this interview.